Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. The reading of this Sunday is the reading of the lame by the pool of Bethesda, and it is the second half of the Lent. We started already in the second part of the Lent. Since last Sunday was the midpoint in the Lent with the Samaritan woman, we're, uh, we're having only two Sundays and then Palm Sunday. So this Sunday is uh, the man, the lame man by the pool. Next Sunday is the man born blind. And then come Palm Sunday. Th- things that's in common between this week and the next week, I, uh, I tell the kids this to remember the Lent themes. So you, have, uh, you can remember them in twos, the seven weeks. So the first week is the kingdom, next to it is the temptation. Then kingdom temptation. The second one is, the third one uh, is, a, and the fourth one is a boy and a girl. The prodigal son and the Samaritan woman. And the last two are sick people, the lame and the blind. But there are more than this for these two weeks. These two weeks are actually preparing for the Holy Week. I'm going to tell you how. So, the beginning of this gospel, Jesus sees a sick man. He sees him, and he, uh, as usual, is very compassionate, and he wants to heal him. But there's going to be a cost. To heal those two people, he will start a confrontation with the Pharisees, with the Jews of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the hub of Judaism at the time. And all the very religious people live there, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees. More than that, the Pharisees, and they were not actually, if you are in their place, you might do more. They're not zealous for no reason. They're very zealous on the Sabbath, especially circumcision, things of that sort. What makes a Jew a Jew? So in the beginning of this gospel, Jesus sees this this person, and uh, he goes to this pool. They tell you about this pool. We don't know where it is today. There might be a place in Jerusalem that when you go, they will show you where it is. Uh, Is it the same one? We don't know. By a place called the Sheep's Gate. Jerusalem has a wall. There's like maybe five or six gates, ancient gates. One of them is called the Sheep's Gate. And the pool was next to this gate. It was a feast. We're not told what feast it was. Jesus went to visit this pool. And this pool is famous because it was a little hospital of a special kind. There were no doctors there. They were familiar with something that happens once a year. Nobody knows when. On a certain day, not not known, just one day a year, they will see the pool stirring up the water moving by itself. So the, the tradition was there was an angel that came down from heaven and touched the pool with special gift. So anyone who comes first to this pool will be healed. And it, this, this grace, this gift, is sufficient for one person, not for everybody. Just one person at every year. So we have this person who is lame. I bet you that the, the worst the worst people that they were thought, thinking we have, we have no luck, are people who have no power in their legs and the blind. And maybe the blind, they will make him a rope or something to tie him, you know, to tie from where he is to the pool so he can guide himself, but he has legs to run. But what about the lame? It's a race. It's a competition. Everybody's going to rush toward the pool, and I'm sure they were competing who would have the, the first place near the pool. So Jesus comes to this place, where this man lies, has been there for, and the, the, the gospel says, 38 years. So he's been trying his luck with this lottery for 38 years. You can imagine the frustration, the, uh, the despair, the agony, and it's like dark for him. So uh, this is the condition where Jesus finds this person. But then at the end of the gospel, you will notice something. He was healed. Jesus healed him. But at the end of the gospel, Jesus is persecuted for the healing. That's what I want to look at today. He was persecuted for a good work. He healed the person, but at the end of it, Jesus carried the price. He had to pay something for it. 
Um, we know from the gospel there is hint that this man was not a saint. He was not a saint. I'll tell you why. What did Jesus say to him when he saw him? So, to go and finish the story, that Jesus saw this man and he asked him a question, do you want to be healed? And, the, you know, the, the answer is obvious. Why am I here, you know? If you find somebody in a clinic or a hospital and a, and a nurse or a doctor comes to them and says, do you want to be cured? What would be the answer? Duh. Why am I here? So there w the man said, yeah, I want to be healed, but, you know, I've been here, in, in his mind, that's the only way to be healed. In my years, I couldn't really get to the water before everybody else. That's why I'm here. I'm not going to leave it. So Jesus said to him, just like that, pick up your bed and go. And the man answered or, or listened to Jesus, picked up his bed, and his legs were strong enough to carry him, and he went home. It was Saturday. It was a Sabbath, like today. That's a no-no in the Jewish culture. You don't do that. That's breaking the most important commandment, keep the Lord's day holy. That is the fourth commandment, and one of the ones that the people were killed for it in the time of Moses. So uh, they saw him and said, what are you doing? And especially this, the rabbi said, don't carry it through a door. You don't go through a door with anything on Sabbath. You can carry it. So let's say a, a woman in her home wants to prepare food. She can carry the pot of food and she would put the plates on the table. That's fine. But don't get out of the kitchen. Okay, that's how they thought about it. So he carried these through many doors. And then they just said, what are you doing? He said, uh, the man who healed me said to do it. Who is this? So in their mind, Jesus is a criminal. Let me just give you a little background about this so you appreciate it. It's not of their fault. Through their history, after they were exiled and deported from Jerusalem 500 years before Christ, they went to Babylon, came back, and they wanted to reestablish everything. They wanted to rebuild the temple and, and the whole bit, and they managed. But then kingdoms ruled the area one after another, and they subdued them. Started with the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then came the Greek. In the time of the Greek, Alexander the Great conquered Jerusalem. Something very fascinating happened to him. I'm not, I don't have the time to tell you about it. But then after he died, the, the kingdom of Alexander was divided into four. To make the story short, the people who ruled Israel, they were called the Seleucids. One of them is named by name Antiochus. He called him, him himself Abiphanes, the revelation of God. That the Jews called him Abimanes, the crazy. Why? In his time, he wanted to turn the Jews into Greeks, and they called it the Hellenizing movement. The scholars called it this, to Hellenize them. So Antiochus, for some reason, nobody knows in history why he went so crazy on the Jews. He wanted them to reverse circumcision. Imagine. He wanted them to break the Sabbath. He wanted them to put idols in the temple and in their homes. He was so aggressive. Actually, in our synexarium, we have martyrs from that time. So, as you imagine, from a human perspective, those who are very zealous for the law of God, for Moses, they went and started fighting against this. A terrorist group came up, and they were, they called themselves the Maccabees. And they were terrorizing the Jews against the actions of, so anybody who goes <coughs> to reverse circumcision, they will go and threaten them with, with killing them. <coughs> it, it's, it's the same spirit that you find in Muslim culture, where people are so zealous for their law, and they would terrorize the other Muslims to follow exactly this. So you find, find the woman not veiled. What, what do they do in the Muslim culture with, with the fanatics would do? They will threaten, throw like uh, sulfuric acid on her, on her face or, you know, burn her or something like that. That's exactly what the Maccabees used to do, terrorizing the Jews. So they said, you're afraid of Antiochus, you should be afraid more of us. You're going to keep the law by all means. We're going to make that happen. So the Maccabees managed. But then what happened after that? The Maccabees ended up being later the movement that we call the Pharisees. Now you understand where the Pharisees are coming from. 
So when they see somebody who is actually doing anything with the Sabbath, what would they do? They would go crazy. Okay, so there's somebody who is actually like Antiochus now. They think of him as an apostate. Somebody who's completely outlaw. That needs to be uh, nipped while still little. So you see that Jesus is going to heal this person, and he might not see him again. I'm not sure how much our Lord was intentionally doing it on the Sabbath. Some people said he did. Some people said he didn't. But on any rate, he has two purposes. One of them, he has to heal this guy. This guy is desperate. He has no way of being healed. He will have to heal him. And he might not come to Jerusalem again, so this is the only time he's going to see him. Jesus does not postpone. He's not a procrastinator. If he's going to do that, do it, he's going to do it today. <laughs> he's not going to do it tomorrow. So, he heals him. But do you think Jesus didn't know that they will come after him? Do you think he uh, forgot it was the Sabbath? Do you think that he forgot that he's in Jerusalem, where the hub of the Pharisees are, like you're going to Mecca, and trying to eat pork over there? You're not going to get out of their life. You're not. So, what is the point? That for helping this person, Jesus will carry a consequence. And he didn't mind it. He did not mind it. Do you think Jesus would say, oh, I should have not done this? I should, if, he, if I went back and I had the chance to say, no, I would have skipped this man. I said, what about, what about tomorrow? I'll be there. Let somebody carry you to where I am tomorrow and we'll do it tomorrow. You think that will happen? No, Jesus will not say that. This brings me to a verse that I love, and I think when I talk to people, and, and most of us, especially those who are grew, growing up here, they don't understand this verse. It's really very interesting. See, I've asked many people, do you really understand this when we talk about examining yourself in confession? And I say, look at this verse from St. Paul. In Galatians, he says, Brother, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you have, you, who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. He says, if someone is sinning, and you see it's obvious, be gentle and be intentional to restore him back to sanctity, to holiness. But be careful, don't judge him, because you might yourself be in the same place. Then he goes to say, and this is a verse that's very hard, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. How to bear one another's burdens? You know, sometimes when you see somebody in the church, or in the family, and, um, or a neighbor, going through a hard time, I hope that nobody would say, good, they deserve it. That's the worst. A little better would say, oh, poor. Thank you, Lord, I don't have the same problem. That's not even Christ yet. That's not even a good Jew. Because the Jews were asked to love their neighbors as themselves. But what it is to be like Christ? What it is to be like Christ? This man today caused Jesus suffering. He caused him hardship. The end of the gospel today, he said, um, go back there, and don't forget what happened at the end. And not, this is not a good man that I can tell you that um, Jesus thinks he deserves it. I'll tell you why. Um, in our tradition, this man later on was, um, ha gave a hard time to the apostles after all that happened, but repented at the very end. Let me just tell you what this man was like. So, they asked the man, who did tell you to carry your bed? Well, you do you want to capture this criminal? And he said, I don't know. He didn't tell me who he was. He didn't know. Jesus actually did it and left. But then he found him in the, in the temple and said, See, you have been made well. Sin no more. 
lest a worse thing come upon you. What does that imply? Try to read between the lines. He was not a saintly man. He was, he had something he had done that is actually causing him in this status all the time. There is something in his life. Only him and Jesus know. But this did not prevent Jesus from doing what? From healing him. So is he a worthy man? Is he a lover of God? Is he a lover of Christ? I don't think so. He might be loving God, but not enough to merit anything. But then that man doesn't stop. He knew that the Jews were, were asking, demanding to find where Jesus was. What does he do? The man departed and intentionally. He went on purpose to go to the Jews and told them, Oh, I know who did it. I know the person who got me to... Okay, they, didn't, they, leave you, they left you alone. You don't need to know anymore. He on purpose went and told them that Jesus, that he knew the name, he knew. Most probably after Jesus finished talking to him, don't send anymore, he said, who is this guy? And they tell him, this is Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, he said, I need to tell somebody. So, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus. Okay, my question is, did you think that Jesus didn't know that this would happen? Do you think that he, they didn't, he didn't know that they will do this to him because of what he have done? I don't think so. I think he knew it. But if he knew it, why would he heal that man? So, they started the persecution and Jesus had to defend himself. And in defending himself, he told him the truth. I am the son of my father. My father had been working till today, and I'm working. Why are you working and why your father is working? And he, when he speaks my father, they understood he speaks about God, whom they claim to be their God. So that's why they understood him perfectly. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him. So this is the price of healing this lame man. The price of healing the lame man is for Jesus to die. He, he not, because not only he broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself huh, equal. Equal. Oisin. Oisin is equal in Greek. Where the word, this is the word where we have it in the creed. We say, homo oisin, equal to the Father in essence. So when the Arians and the Council of Nicaea said, this is not in the Bible, they said, this is not written exactly in the Bible, but it is implied, and this story is one of the places that Jesus equal to God the Father. And they wanted to kill him. And Jesus never defended himself and said, no, guys, you don't understand me. I'm not saying that I am God. I'm not saying that I'm equal father. He never defended himself. He went all the way to the cross for this purpose. So I just want us also to understand this is one, not one thing and not the other. Yes, Jesus was going to the, to the cross. He will be crucified. And he's provoking them to go that way. But he also did it because he wanted to heal the man. It was very intentional. If you are in a situation where you have a someone that you can help or you see in need of help but will cost you something, what do you do? I ask this question in confession. When we go over our list of commandments and I say, do you, do you refrain from helping somebody if it will be costly to you? Will you refrain from any service if it's going to get you out of your comfort zone and push you a little bit out? where you're not very comfortable and cost you something. Will you? Think about that. Have you ever seen somebody in need and you said, I, I, no, I'm not ready for this now. From now and then until the Holy Week, the next story even will be better. I'm not going to tell you that because this story and the next story have something in common. Both of them happened on the Sabbath and both of, of them will cause Jesus big trouble. It's escalating from now on. So this is the first step in St. John Gospel, and the church sees it this way. The next one is a man born blind, healed on the Sabbath. And the third one would be the straw that will break the camel's back, is raising Lazarus. So those three comes one after another in the church tradition that shows us 
that Jesus is coming to carry a consequence of our healing, of our life. Because of a healing of a man today, he was persecuted. Because of an opening of an eye of a man next Sunday, he will be more persecuted. Because of raising Lazarus from the dead, he will be condemned to death. That's St. John's Gospel. So, if St. Paul is going to tell us something today, he says, now you know this. You know how Jesus is like. Will you be like him? I will go back to that verse again one time. And I'm going to read it with you. One more time in Galatians. And it's the last chapter. And it's verse 2. He says, if there, someone is in sin, someone doing wrong, something not, someone doing not well, would you be gentle in fixing that person N not judging them because you might be in the same place. We all have the same weaknesses. And then he goes to say this beautiful verse. He says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So what does he mean by the law of Christ? What is the law of Christ? Now I kind of explained it to you. What's the law of Christ? The law of Christ, love even when love hurts. Love even when love costs. Help when it is inconvenient. Serve when it is costly. That is the law of Christ. Because he showed us that very clearly, and especially in the, in the last week of his life, when he went on to heal and raise and help, and knowing that it will cost him a lot. I ask that the Lord will give us this spirit, the spirit of love that actually as we're seeking in the Lent. In the Lent, we don't really fast to be like the Pharisees. Don't be like them. They only thought about it from this human perspective. They didn't have that image revealed. Well, I don't think Jesus condemned them. They did what they thought would be right. But we know better. We know much better. We've seen much better. And based on that, we act. No one can do something that Jesus did not, or better than Jesus had done. So let, let him be our example, our model, our light, and follow him, even if it costs us. To him is the glory with the good Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.